And it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter. As a toddler, Oren Helbach's initial reaction to a steam locomotive was quite similar to my own. He ran away crying. Like me, he quickly turned around. And also like me, he benefited greatly from a supportive family. Born in the Bronx in 1965, Oren learned the technical aspects of film photography from his father, John. And Oren spent 25 years in dark rooms before raising children and then going digital. He now runs a nonprofit arts organization in central Pennsylvania, where he lives closer to more active steam locomotives than he could in any other place in the country. Oren's father, John, was an airplane enthusiast as a boy and a young man, but he eventually came down from the clouds and got his priorities straight when Oren began developing a passion for trains. John became an eager and passionate rail fan as he traveled with his son throughout the eastern United States in search of steam locomotives. Entirely self-taught as a photographer, John put much more effort into giving prints to railroaders than into getting anything published. We all might learn something from that approach. But he did make regular contributions to the Steam Locomotive Directory and Locomotive and Railway Preservation Magazine. Their presentation, which will be delivered by Oren, is called Two Viewfinders, One Point of View. And it showcases half a century of their photography alongside one another. Won't you please join me in welcoming Oren Helbach to our stage. Good morning. It is really thrilling for me to be standing up here in the presence of some of the great railroad photographers and writers, and I feel like a little boy. Unfortunately, I'm actually approaching or possibly even passing through middle age, depending on who you talk to. One of the symptoms of that is that I find myself repeating stories and offering advice to younger people, even if they haven't asked for it. One of the things that I find myself saying with some regularity is luck favors the well-prepared. I consider myself an extremely lucky person, but not through my own preparation. It's because of the people I was born to. I had parents who, among so many other things, recognized immediately my passion for trains and not only nurtured it, but shared it. Before I talk about my father, I'd like to thank my mother, Miriam, who spent countless hours with me at trackside, riding trains, and my stepmother, Carol, who's here today, who has put up with my father and me and our passion for a long time. In addition, I dedicate this presentation to the many railroaders who have given us access over the years and to the many, many other people who have helped and shown kindness wherever we have gone over the half century. My father could have fallen in love with trains when he was a boy. Although his family lived in the South Bronx, they spent all of their summers in his mother's hometown, Lac Megansic, Quebec, a place that has become famous very unfortunately recently. My grandmother's father, Arthur Counter, worked his whole career for the Quebec Central Railroad. He was an engineer from the 1910s onward. For reasons I don't know, he hated the railroad, and he, is, he encouraged his family to stay away from it. So my father has some memories of the trains coming and going down the hill in Lac Megansic, down the hill from his grandparents' house on the west side of town, but he didn't pay much attention to them. Just as a sidebar, the CP ran their, their two 484s, came back and forth through town on the Atlantic Limited every day during my father's entire childhood, not among his memories. As Scott said, the first time I, I heard a steam locomotive, not the first time I saw one, but the first time I heard one, that was me. The photograph does not show here, though, me very quickly turning around. Something about these trains, even by then, had just grabbed me, and my father recognized that. I can't remember a time I didn't love trains. As Scott said, my father grew up loving airplanes. He learned to fly at age 18. His mother let him keep some of the money he made at the A&P in the South Bronx so he could take flying lessons. He got his license. My grandmother lived to be 105. My father always says that he is most grateful to her for giving him the ability to go learn to fly. I came along, I loved trains, and my father became an almost instant rail fan. 
He had started taking pictures before I came along, using the bathroom in the family's apartment as his darkroom. He worked in black and white, initially with a 35-millimeter half-frame Olympus Pen FT. My father's never thought of himself as an artist, but from the very beginning, he had a natural ability to compose striking images. And in my bedroom as a child, my father's photos hung on all the walls, including this one. It's one of his earliest railroad pictures, to me, a true icon. These prints also hung on my bedroom walls, but my father exposed me to many other people's photographs. We started subscribing to Trains Magazine around the time I turned two, and David Plowden's book, Farewell to Steam, had already come out. My father bought it when it came out, and I learned every photo in that book long before I could read. More and more books and magazines came into the house. We looked at images by Plowden, Hastings, Shaughnessy, Steinheimer, Gruber, Beebe, Clegg, a host of other masters who helped shape the way that I look at the world. And of course, they influenced my father as well. And whether or not he thought about it consciously, he followed in those masters' footsteps. Our early rail fan experiences coincided with a golden age for steam railroading in the Northeast. Ross Rowland ran long-distance excursions, performed high-speed runbys with a series of ever-larger locomotives, and at the same time, more and more tourist railroads operated, some even close to where we lived in New York. So I ask you, if every child had that photograph on his or her bedroom wall, wouldn't every child become a rail fan? <laughs> Before I turned seven, my father moved up to a Mamiya twin lens, and he gave me the Pen F. He taught me how to use it, how to develop film, how to make prints, and he gave me some advice about how to compose a picture, mostly to think about what I would not want in it, diesels, billboards, and other rail fans. <laughs> Neither one of us has ever tried to make photos to fool anyone into thinking they dated from decades earlier, but on the other hand, we usually want to avoid modern intrusions. And I would never claim one of my photos as one of my own, but if in the future you remember this presentation and some of the images in it, and you can't remember which are his and which are mine, that's fine. <laughs> Mostly, my father taught me how to see by teaching me how to be. And by that I mean he encouraged and embodied an endless curiosity about the world. And he passed on his gregariousness to me, too. He can talk to anyone, anywhere. And I count this as just about my most valued inheritance from him. Because aside from greasing the wheels of human interaction, it leads to access. Over Memorial Day weekend of 1972, my father and I and three of his high school students chased X Reading Company 2102 from New Jersey to Washington and back on the Royal Blue Route. Somewhere along the way, I stood next to my father and made my very first photograph as we pressed the shutter buttons at almost exactly the same instant. The group photo we made at some fast food joint along the road somewhere, my father at the rear, age 35, not yet 35, the students, and me at age six and three quarters. 2018 marked 50 years that one of those students, Richard Boylan, and my father and I have chased trains together. We celebrated the occasion by spending the weekend with the loudest locomotive any of us has ever heard. A while ago, I asked my father if he had a photographic philosophy, some system of constructing a picture. He said, I like what my eyes like. Walker Evans, another of my heroes, wrote, whether he is an artist or not, the photographer is a joyous sensualist for the simple reason that the eye traffics in feelings, not in thoughts, which sounds exactly like what my father said. I have realized in the past few years that I want to capture railroading in a big picture way. I don't claim any originality in this, but to me, railroad encompasses three major themes. First, there is the landscape, and by that I mean everything surrounding the railroad, cornfields, towns, the weather. Second, there's the hardware, the tracks, the railroad structures, the locomotives and cars. And third, 
the people who bring the trains to life. My father, and whether or not he really thought about this, he was influenced by the work of all of those masters whom I mentioned. Those people were our influences. They had captured that big picture. Those were the things that my father and I went out to capture as well. His photographs span that whole range. My father has always liked bridges, where the paths of railroads and rivers cross. On that same DC trip in 1972, and looking for a way to photograph this bridge, someone who was doing the navigating in my father's Chevy van, one of those students, found a marina in Perryville, Maryland, from which we got this perfect side-on view. Way back then, we used United States Geological Survey quadrant maps and SO road maps to find our way. My father and I have the same intuitive appreciation for that interaction of the railroad and the landscape, which demonstrates human ingenuity and its influence on the natural world. My father made this one and the previous photo during the 1991 NRHS convention, around which he and I spent a week on the road together, camping in a tent and eating donuts for breakfast, one of our classic railfan trips. Not so well known, this is the 160-foot-high, 900-foot-long hometown trestle. It's in near Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. It sits almost within sight of I-81, but it requires a mile-long walk to get to this location. I can remember some really long walks during my childhood as my father sought out a particular location. Now, there's no walk required at hometown if you have the opportunity to ride over it. The photograph that Matthew Malkowitz won the CRPA contest with a few years ago directly influenced how I processed this photograph. Getting, getting to the weather, ordinarily my father and I each have an excellent sense of direction. But this day in Rarit, New Jersey, we got pretty close to hopelessly lost trying to find the central of New Jersey tower in the pea soup fog. Somehow we did end up there. And my father made this memorable image of a light Pacific built for service in Florida, masquerading as one of the legendary engines that had pulled the Blue Comet to Atlantic City. My father found that masquerade quite unattractive. He thought that that sign did not belong in this locomotive, and we did not chase the train anywhere past Raritan. We must have seen a lovely 260 when we dropped in at Rail City in Sandy Pond, New York in 1975. The year after that, Pioneer Rail Museum shut down. So what a joy, four decades later, to find that very locomotive leaving a trail of condensate through a beautiful valley as her whistle echoes among the Pennsylvania hills. On foggy days and sunny ones. At the 2017 CRPA conference right here, Ron Hill showed us how he has returned to the same tried and true locations, making images that capture the same scene but in different seasons and in, with different trains. My father and I, too, have locations that we keep returning to, including this one for me. In different weather and in different seasons, they never get old. Once in a blue moon, we have photographed trains without steam power on the head end, and rarely in better weather than this. This is in our neighborhood in the Bronx, at Spite and Dival. I grew up a mile from here. In the background, you can just barely see the Henry Hudson Bridge. This, this is a New York Central. It was still New York Central at that point, 1967. This engine did at least produce steam. It had a steam generator to warm the coaches behind it. And you can see the steam coming out from the connection on the pilot there. A few years later, these cars on the Lackawanna, the old MU cars, they were already 50 years old. They'd been slated for replacement for a long time. And they weren't quite as exciting as P-motors, but they were what we had. And we appreciated these cars for a couple of reasons. One, their pedigree. Thomas Edison ran the first train out of Hoboken Terminal in 1930. And they had rattan seats and open windows, so they were fun to ride. I went to the high school where my father taught. And in New York City, we rarely had snow days. But on one of those very few snow days, we got in the car and went there. In 1982, we had a rare April nor'easter, dropped a foot of snow in the Hudson Valley. 
So we got in the car. My father drove his Plymouth K car through the drifts to Rhinecliff on the former New York Central Hudson Division. On the way back to my grandmother's house across the river, he slid the car into a ditch and bent one of the front struts, which is fortunately the worst accident we ever had while out rail fanning. The winter after Steamtown's grand opening, the Park Service ran a few trips, including one in February, with CPR 2317 on the westbound leg. For the rail fans, the crew did a couple of runbys through Toby Hanna before they went west. This is a scan of a two and a quarter negative of mine. My father had moved on yet to his fourth camera, a Pentax 645, and I inherited the third one, the Bronica 2S. And that's my father there on the left. In 2009, my father and my son and I chased the Steamtown Ice Harvest train on a day when the temperature was 18 degrees below zero on the Lake Atobihanna at dawn. My father had gone digital by then. I had not yet returned to serious photography after more than a decade shooting a thousand rolls of color film with my children. Dennis Livesey was out here on this day also, and he considers it one of the great days of his life. Nothing beats steam in the snow. You have the elemental forces of fire and steam, the elemental forces of cold and ice. A few occasions really stand out, like the East Broadtop Winter Spectacular in 1972. It snowed so hard on Friday that on Saturday morning, the crew could barely budge the Armstrong turntable because the pit was full of snow. So they put the engine away and closed the door, and that was the end of the Winter Spectacular. So the four of us, it was my father and me and two of his high school students in his Chevy van, we left the EBT behind and crawled across the Pensy Turnpike as the snow continued to fall, headed for Strasburg. They were gonna run. Every radio station across Pennsylvania was playing American Pie that year. The next day, my father helped re-rail one of the Strasburg locomotives after the tender truck derailed on the ice in the crossing just outside the engine house. This photo from Strasbourg is another snowy day 45 years later. Alone among the steam railroads in the Northeast, Strasbourg ran pretty much year round back then. So my father and I saw steam in the snow there much more than anywhere else. In the decades since my father made this image, the crossing watchman's tower near the engine house has come down. The railroad uses a front end loader to coal its locomotives. So even on heritage lines, history marches on. Although often fairly conventional in his preference for lighting, sunny side of the track, sun on the face of the engine, my father plainly recognized other possibilities, such as when he made this striking image that captures the locomotive exhaust swirling through the branches of that magnificent sycamore, which also all these, all these years later is now gone. In the winter 2017 issue of Railroad Heritage, Alexander Benjamin Craghead wrote about J.B. Jackson, who was in a, a 20th century American landscape theorist. Craighead wrote, the photographer should do as the keen observer of the landscape does, see beauty and meaning in the ordinary and the everyday, and look sideways at the world, not merely back. This is one of those cases where I was ahead of the torch. Worcester, Mass, I was living there at the time. I got this photograph, and two weeks later, the railroad painted that over, and it's orange and brown now. At the CRPA conference the previous fall in 2016, Craghead had given another presentation, and the last sentence resonated really powerfully with me. Speaking of the contemporary, lonely, isolated railroad landscape, Craghead asked, what might we see as photographers if we attempted to make such characteristics more centrally our subject? How might we change railroad photography if, like Jackson, we less often looked backwards and more often looked around. Even taken quite literally, it makes for really good advice. At Brush Mountain in 2010, I had set up for the obvious shot, the engine coming out of the tunnel. The train passed, and I literally looked around. And in the still, humid, sub-freezing air, the smoke and condensate that had collected around the train in the tunnel clung to the cars like a blanket. Here's another example of looking around, although as at Brush Mountain, it was before I had a name for it, a train photo without a train in it, but made from a Strasbourg Railroad coach. 
It was a beautiful, warm, late winter day. Can't you just smell the rich earth and the coal smoke in Lancaster County? This is one of my father's iconic images, a beautiful silhouette. And that locomotive was born the same year he was, 1937. So it's a tourist train, rural New Jersey. The important thing is the corn, the chest-high corn. It's an excellent example of my father including the landscape surrounding the railroad, not just focusing on the train. I call this photograph the machine in the garden. There is a locomotive there. In 1964, Leo Marx wrote a book with that name, The Machine in the Garden. He wrote, within the lifetime of a single generation, a rustic and in large part wild landscape was transformed into the site of the world's most productive industrial machine. It would be difficult to imagine more profound contradictions of value or meaning than those made manifest by this circumstance. He's talking about how the world changed when railroads and industry invaded that landscape. But yet, as David P. Morgan wrote, rails do not crease, they bind. They live in that landscape. These images of 1225 and 765 demonstrate the importance of context and landmarks to my father's composition by their absence. These photos wouldn't have looked out of place in a BB book, wedge shots in unidentifiable places. Well, that's a John Helbach photograph. There are authentic railroaders in it. It's a particular place, even if it does include diesels. I was still thinking about steam at that point, steam, steam, steam. So I stood a ways off to the right, cut out the diesels, and don't have anywhere near as interesting a photograph. Even simply including the pole line here it makes it much more interesting than if he had stood a few feet farther to the left and eliminated it. Of course, had he done that, he wouldn't have caught the camcorder-wielding rail fan either. Here we have examples from both the Pen F and the Mamiya made in almost the exact same spot. But by shifting his vantage point higher, up into the third dimension, he climbed up the signal mast. My father has made complementary views that more fully capture the atmosphere of the Mars County Central. It was one of the early tourist lines and one of the first places where he and I saw steam. My father stayed behind when the rest of his siblings and his mother left the Bronx behind for the Hudson Valley. But on visits to them, that gave us opportunities to get to know another of the first generation tourist lines looking here for all the world like a short line south of the Mason-Dixon line. Like, say, the Virginia Blue Ridge, where that very locomotive had operated just a few years before. The Virginia Blue Ridge doesn't appear in the classic book Mixed Train Daily, and we didn't own the book in that era. That prior image looks very much like Charles Clegg might have photographed a short line in Virginia. That is a BB photograph with the burning of Rome smoke. This photo appeared in the, in the August 1971 issue of Trains Magazine. It was the first of my father's photos to get published anywhere. It shows the maiden run of the 148 at Black River after her restoration. Don Smith, the engineer, he had worked for EMD as a locomotive operations instructor at the dawn of the diesel era. He hired on in 1938. Here's another Southern Shortline engine. This little 262 ran on the Sumter and Choctaw in South Carolina for 30 years and looked right at home on the Valley Railroad's former New Haven branch line. Adding to the timelessness of the scene, there's a small boy standing there on the platform waiting for the train to come in. We didn't have a dog, though, for me to pose with. In late 1990, the Blue Mountain and Redding expanded from a 13-mile branch line into a really substantial regional railroad and they could put on a show to match. X Reading Company 484 on the X Reading main line. My father and I chose this location for the sense of place that that old mill provided. And the pole line with its web of wires attached added yet more to his composition. More than 27 years later, parts of the old mill look much the worse for wear. The pole line is gone. And on a gray day, that wedge shot against the rock wall didn't appeal to me. 
Time to look around. Where's a more interesting angle that still captures this particular place? In the company of Matthew Malkowitz himself, he was chasing with me that day, inspiration strikes. Who needs a drone? <laughs> so it's gotten harder and harder to capture what we think of as the railroad environment. The signals are gone, the interlocking towers are gone, the pole lines are gone. So we have to think outside of the old box. This image, it includes modern, what we think of as intrusions, those vehicles, but it also captures the feel of that street in Nesquehoning. That's the only place where that picture could be made. I also like this photograph because of the effort I went through to make it without a drone. Here we have a mill pond surrounded by buildings with a track running through it. Everywhere we look in that image, it's the hand of man on the landscape. But it's bucolic nonetheless. And it's a lovely scene that my father appreciated. He chose to record this as representing the railroad. And that image graced the Wolfsboro Railroad's page in the Steam Directory for a few years. A large percentage of my father's public photos appeared in that guide, the annual guide, and he got us great access. He'd show up at a tourist railroad. I'm John Helbach from New York. I'm taking pictures for the Steam Directory. Come on in. <laughs> at Mount Washington, for example, I don't know how he did this. He got us permission to ride the cog railway up and down all day long and have the train stop wherever he wished for us to get off and make the photograph, and we'd catch the next train. The photograph that he made, not this one, but the one that he made at Wombeck Tank was in the directory for years. He also got us permission to camp at the top. You're supposed to only camp at the top if you hike, and we, of course, drove, and we camped in the back of the Chevy. There was cloud, solid layer of cloud at 5,000 feet that night. We were at 6,200, and we watched the sunset over an ocean of pink cloud with just a few of the other presidential mountains standing up in the distance. So this is a complete departure. It breaks every rule that my father taught me. Wires, poles, cars. But by rubbing shoulders at trackside with photographers like Mike Froyo, say, I've had my eyes open to many possibilities. And I think this image captures some of the excitement in a little Pennsylvania town as a speeding locomotive roars through with the whistle wailing. It's a glimpse of what we could have seen there once upon a time, all of the time. So the landscape and the hardware themes can overlap. I don't know how we found out about these things in the pre-internet age. My father and I went out into the Jersey Meadows to photograph the inaugural run of a freshly repainted pinstripe GG1. That was a heritage unit before the term existed. Is it a straight three-quarter shot of a train? Yes, but there's a lot more going on here. The Pulaski Skyway in the background, Croxton Yard running across the foreground. My father has put that train and the whole Pennsylvania Main Line into a place. And there are a couple of details here that just astonish me now. The, the, you can barely see here, but there's a Canadian Pacific boxcar in the lower right that has the script lettering on it. And all that track on the northeast corridor is jointed rail. Ancient history. My father and I did some of our rail fanning by train. We take the Hudson tubes to Hoboken and Newark and hang out on the platforms. Pre 9-11, no one ever said anything. We loved the GG1s almost as much as steam locomotives, and we saw the 4935 a handful of times after that maiden run, always by chance. Does any Pensy location show industrial age muscle better than Dock Drawbridge? By now, this location is a required stop for CRPA attendees. <laughs> On the eve of the 2016 conference, the first one that George Hyotis and I came out to together, we went to the intersection of Lake and Wells. We climb up to the top of the parking garage. And who do we meet but this guy named Todd Halamka, who we'd never seen before. We stayed up there and froze for about two hours, got our photographs, come downstairs in the elevator, get out of the elevator, and there's the security guard demanding to know what we'd been doing for the last two hours. The people in the building across the street had reported us, concerned that we had been spying on them all evening. I don't know why they didn't notice that we spent all evening looking straight down. <laughs> this is one of my father's very favorites among his photographs. 
A print of this hung on my bedroom wall for years. But this photograph scared me a little. Up there in the exhaust, I could see an eye of some gigantic creature. But somewhere deep, deep in my memory, I remember being there for this photograph with my father and my mother on the bank of the Hudson River waiting for this train at age three. Probably the first time I was out with my father to chase big steam. During spring break of my sophomore year in college, we spent a few days at Steamtown, which had moved from Vermont to Pennsylvania. This was a trip that we almost didn't come home from. To get this photograph, we walked through the Nayog Tunnel, 750 feet, got our photograph, and then walked back through the tunnel, 750 feet, after the locomotive had left wet, heavy smoke that completely filled the tunnel. We spit out gobs of soot for a few days and did not feel right for those few days. That was a lesson we learned. From 1970 until my college years, we spent more time at the Black River in Western in New Jersey than any other steam railroad. I don't know how my father got connected there, but I remember the first visit that I remember, my mother and I took the bus from New York City. We go out to Flemington. We ask someone, where's the train station? We walk to the train station. We wait, and here comes a freight train with an SW-1 at the head end. My father swings off the SW-1, ushers us into the cab, and we rode down to Ringo's. This print I made and sepia toned as a high school freshman. These are photos of a run-by on the former Pensy's Belvedere, Delaware division. Black River had just picked up a piece of that after the Conrail split. To get his photograph, my father climbed up on top of a railroad phone box, and I was sort of jealous that I had to crouch underneath him to get my photograph, but I've always really liked mine, partly because of the excitement this, that this photograph conveys, at least to me. If you look in the smokestack in my photograph at the top, you can see the spark screen that's about to get ejected from the stack and thrown out into the countryside. The engineer, Lloyd Arkenstall, learned railroading on the Pensy on the New York and Long Branch during World War II, and on the Long Branch, you opened the throttle and went. Jackrabbit starts and stops. So 60 was one of the first engines I spent significant time around. That engine maintains a firm place in my heart. If I had to choose one locomotive to take to a desert island, it would be her. She has a bell worthy of a church, a whistle worthy of the angels, and somehow she looks exactly right, even though she's got little drivers, her cab is too small, her stack is too tall, but she's perfect. And this photo inside the cab at night of my father's is perfect. It is a platonic ideal photo to me. And it shows, again, how my father appreciated railroading and the hardware at the range of scales. The machine in the garden that I showed earlier minimizes the hardware in the landscape. This image removes all context. It's all hardware. And with a 15 millimeter lens, it's possible to turn a small 260 into a monster of the high iron. Now imagine this hardware rotating at nine times per second. That's a Norfolk and Western J at 110 miles an hour. Gives you some idea of why C.E. Pond and his associates in the motor power building had such outstanding reputations. My father and I first saw 611 in 1973 in the park in Roanoke. He remembers me saying, wouldn't it be great if this engine ran? Together we saw her run in 1983. We chased her on the former southern main line from Alexandria to Lynchburg and back. And that night in the tiny yard at Alexandria, the friendly hostler invited me into the cab and I got a 100 foot ride. Contrary to what the photo shows, I did not get to move the engine myself. My father has had Lyme disease for many years, can't handle days and days on the road eating donuts the way you used to do. So I sometimes travel with other people now. In the spring of 2016, my friend Richard Boylan and I, we had one last chance to chase the 611 on her home turf, passing position light signals. Those were all scheduled to be taken down for positive train control. So we go out to Blue Ridge on Saturday morning, and there's one heck of a crowd. Our little band closest to the signals, there were no fewer than 10 of us in an area the size of this podium. Rick Ahern had tramped in before dawn, and then four German fans had crowded around him. I squeezed in around 8 o'clock. Michael and Florence Eagleson joined us just before train time, and at least a couple more. Behind us, up the track, there were other groups on both sides. Richard was somewhere in there, at least 100 people. 
We heard the whistle before we saw anything. Then we could hear the exhaust, even at a distance, an unmistakable roar. Smoke appeared over the trees, the storm cloud bringing the thunder. Our hearts raced, our breathing stopped, and here she came. Just hardware or a living, breathing thing? So with this photo, we reach the last grand theme of railroading. It's the one closest to my heart. It's the people who make the trains run. It took me many years to realize this. I spent my youth and young adulthood shooting hardware. I don't have a single close-up photograph of Lloyd Arkenstall. He was a fine railroader and one of the finest people we ever met around steam. But my father's appreciation for railroad people and his relationships with them made so many of our experiences and photographs possible. He did not match his gregariousness with organization and note-taking. So where we have the names of those people from many years ago, it mostly comes down to me remembering them. As a kid, I could remember everybody's name. Now that I may not be a kid anymore, I carry notebooks and I write everything down. And when I process a photograph, I put the people's names right there into the file name. So from 1972 to 78, my father and I spent a month each summer on the road, the trips on which he made many of his steam directory photographs. At the arcade in Attica, the access that that led to got us a cab ride in number 14 to Couriers and Back with Mr. Lester. It took me more than 40 years to get back to Arcade after those first two visits in the 1970s. I go into the depot in Arcade, they've got a huge array of historic photographs of the railroad going all the way back in time. The people, the railroad, wonderful photographs, including this one. Because when we went back there in 1975, my father gave them a print that, of the photograph he had made in 1972. An excellent, excellent example of the trail of goodwill that he has left behind everywhere we've gone. I've come to believe that part of the magnetism of steam is clouds. My father's photos show his intuitive understanding of this too. Smoke bespeaks power. And although the engineer is small in this photograph, we know that he has an intimate relationship with that power. Condensed steam, on the other hand, much more gentle. It brings the clouds in the sky down to earth, and it uplifts all whom it touches. A moment before I made these photos, the little girl's father had held her up so she could look inside the cab. No one had to prompt her reaction to that condensed steam. Pure wonderment and joy. <laughs> I think I know exactly how she feels. The young man in the photo here, lost in admiration, maybe he's dreaming about the day that he gets to be on the right-hand seat box of that locomotive. I know how he feels, too. I imagine many of you do also. My father made this self-portrait. He was cleaning out the smokestack of Black River's number 60. He doesn't remember who tripped the shutter on the camera, but I was only five, and it was probably not me. I made this photograph on a day he worked on their Pacific, the 148. Around the same time, my father spent a day as one of the railroad's volunteer gandy dancers and learned the hard way that he has an allergy to creosote. For a brief time in the late 1970s, it looked as if a Pensy Pattern 460 would come out of a park on Long Island and go to run at Black River. My father and I were among the volunteers who helped take the engine apart, and on one of those work days, we took all of the superheater units out, my father and I did. We went home, and I was so dirty that my mother almost did not let me in the house. If this photo looks familiar, you might have seen the black and white version, which was a runner-up in the 2017 CRPA contest. And I can't help but wonder if I should have entered the color one. <laughs> so we have ridden steam locomotives, my father and I, at least as far back as 1973. We got a cab ride to the top of Bald Knob and back at Cass with Artie Barkley. On the Allegheny Central in the 1970s, we shared fireman's duties on a former Canadian Pacific 462. My father did all of the shoveling, and I ran the injector. We have both especially enjoyed cab rides at night. 
when it's just you, us, in that little world in the locomotive. Before digital cameras, it never would have occurred to us to try to photograph that. Since 2015, I've become good friends with Ross Gockenauer, who's a 20-year employee at Strasbourg. For all the practice I now have photographing STEAM's workers, I find it easier to do well with people I know. I still feel some self-consciousness about it. I don't think my father ever did. Once he goes to work, Ross ignores the photographer and the camera. But he has introduced me to Santa, who runs in the, rides in the caboose all day. I get the access. So by the time my father turned 50, I had graduated from college, moved away from home. We've spent much less time together in the last 30 years than we did in the previous 20. I had moved, as Scott said, to the greatest concentration of steam railroading in North America. About 20 standard gauge locomotives have operated within three hours of me in the last decade. As part of documenting the railroad environment, that, of course, includes us fans. I usually try to cut them out of pictures, but every now and then, I do want them. We are part of the story. Except for those high school boys who joined us, we used to do this as solitaries, my father and me together. Now, it's become my primary social activity. These are just a few of the people I've got to share trackside time with recently. Other people have chased trains with us occasionally. This is a photograph that my son made on a day of a Steamtown uh, ice harvest train in 2005. He had just learned to use a camera. I had just handed him a digital camera. I didn't know a thing about it. It ran across the spread in Rail Fan magazine the following spring. The boy was five years old, 10 days before he made the photograph. He inherited some of my father's intuitive ability how to compose a photo. Norfolk Southern borrowed 765 for some employee trips. My son and I went out to take photographs. Here are his and mine, made at the same time. I've always thought of my father's outstanding in the field. I had not remembered until late in the process of putting this presentation together that my stepmother aimed her camera at trains now and again, too. And I wish she had stuck with it, because she made some fine images. Carol and my father stood almost right next to each other, hit the shutter at almost the exact same instant, just like me and him. Here, they did not hit their shutters at the exact same instant, and my father actually prefers her photograph to his. He had shot early and then had to wind the film on the Bronica and shot what he thinks late. Carol got it perfect. Half a lifetime ago, my father and I spent most of a hot summer week chasing big steam during that NRHS convention. The sun went down on Saturday, the Berkshires hadn't yet come back through Thurmond, and we headed home. But we realized there was still one more steam locomotive we could see. And we drove overnight, the only time we ever did it. We got to Ringo's at 3 o'clock in the morning. We camped out on one of the coach seats. This was us the next morning, bright-tailed and bushy-eyed. And by coincidence, that is a photograph of my father at the exact same age that I am today. 47 years have gone by since he handed me a camera. We still go to the same places that we've been my entire life. At the steam railroads we visit nowadays, there's a new generation coming up, a new generation of young people learning steam. And of course, surrounding my father and me are the young photographers who are coming up using new technology, doing terrific work inspired by the masters, and giving us all a run for our money in the CRPA contests. We love railroading and steam locomotives. They're the most alive of all of humanity's creations. We want to photograph the interaction of the people with those locomotives. Is that Bob Butterfield waiting to take the 20th century west from Harmon? No, it's Norm Cole in a low driver 280. But that photograph shows us why we envy that engineer. It's not that he has control over the locomotive, it's that he gets to work with it. And that interaction somehow elevates him among us mortals standing on the ballast. Railroads are heroic enterprises. Railroad people are heroic. We often don't show our subjects' faces in these photographs. I believe we do that on purpose. We're not dehumanizing them, or we're, we're depersonalizing them. We're not dehumanizing them. They stand in for all of those people who have done these jobs in the decades before. 
to share these feelings that we have, we give away photographs. As Scott said, we have given away so many more photographs than we've ever had published. I need to give thanks to my friend Matt Kirsted, who has given a presentation at these conferences about the book Stations. Because of this book and Matt's analysis of it, I recognize it is the feelings that we have that is fundamental to our experience. We have gotten up at 4 a.m., we've eaten stale donuts, we've gotten very dirty, we've gotten very lost, we've gotten stuck in snowdrifts, we've cursed at clouds, we've waited for trains that never came, we missed trains, we survived bee stings, we've screwed up film, we've had our batteries die, and we wouldn't trade a minute of it because we love this and it gives us joy. I return to this picture because I consider it one of my father's very finest. This epitomizes what railroad photography is to him and to me, the drama, the beauty, and humanity. It took Steve Wickersham 40 years to get a copy of that because back then we didn't know who he was. Thanks to the internet, a mutual friend got us in touch after my father posted this in 2014. My father made the 16 by 20. It hangs in Steve's living room. We've never met, but we share the bond. In closing, I want to offer my deepest, most heartfelt thanks to my father. Because of his energy, enthusiasm, encouragement, support, and companionship, my childhood love for trains developed into a deeply satisfying lifelong passion. We shared countless priceless experiences that he made possible by the way that he approaches the world and the people in it. Following the path that he opened before me, I have had countless more priceless experiences I've even gotten to make some and share some with my own children. And I get to call many of you in this audience my friends. That makes me a very, very lucky person. Thank you.